Alors, le prochain conférencier. The next speaker. Dr. Luc Veliquet. Back and Canadian Urological Association and the Society International d'Urologie. Dr. Luc Valiquet is a urology surgery specialist at the University of Montreal Hospital Centre, the CHUM as well, as well, and a full professor at the Montreal University Surgery Department. He has been program director for urology training and member of the accreditation committee at the uh, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Involved in numerous clinical research studies, his areas of focus include prostate cancer, urinary incontinence, erectile dysfunction, electronic medical files, amongst others. Since 1985, the year he began his practice, he has taught surgery and urology at the graduate and postgraduate levels, as, as well as in continuing medical education. Dr. Vediket is the author of more than 250 abstracts paper and book chapters. He sits on a number of advisory committee, charitable or organization, and Canada Health InfoWay. Please welcome Dr. Luc Vadiquet. Thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, as you have learned, I knew Fred for many years, and uh, his wife and my wife meet uh, every week at uh, at a breakfast, an academic breakfast on the South Shore, and they complain together about us working too hard. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to see Fred present, and uh, Fred is one of the residents we are very proud of having form, but he, uh, he was a little bit stubborn and able to do his things on his own, and I think his uh, research uh, involvement has been very successful, and he focused on prostate cancer, and he's on not only well-known in Quebec, but having uh, traveled all over the world, I can tell you that everywhere I go, uh, my friends uh, in different countries who work on prostate cancer, they all know Fred very well. My talk today will be, uh, my task is to tell you about uh, erectile dysfunction uh, and incontinence, why it happens and how to treat it. So treatments and complication, uh, urological complication do occur after prostate cancer treatment. After radical prostatectomy, you may get the two uh, most frequent complications are erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. And depending on the definitions you use and when you assess the problem, the, the, the percentage will vary. If you look at the erectile dysfunction after a year after a radical prostatectomy, the uh, erectile dysfunction will vary between 30 and 80 percent of the patient, depending on the definition. If they don't use treatment, if you don't if you don't take into account that they take Viagra Cialis, it can go up to 80 percent of patient. But if you take into account that they may use oral treatment, the numbers go down to 20 to 50 percent. Urinary incontinence also after radical prostatectomy is very frequent, frequent immediately after the surgery, but after a year, again depending on the definition, uh, you will have between 10 to 20 percent of patients who will occasionally wear a pad if they know that they're going to do sports or strenuous activities, but only 3 to 5 percent of the patient will require a definitive treatment for their incontinence. Same thing for radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is being presented as being non-surgical, but radiotherapy also can give problems. And after five years, radiotherapy will give approximately the same amount of erectile dysfunction as five years after radical prostatectomy. And the incontinence, however, is very rare after radiotherapy, but they may have local symptoms because uh, when you have radiotherapy, and we will see this later, it doesn't affect only the bladder, it will also affect the surrounding organs. You can get uh, radiation cystitis and you can have uh, urinary problems. That's why more and more active surveillance is being considered as an option for treatment because if you're only observe, you won't have these complications. However, you have a risk of seeing your cancer progress. So if you're in a surveillance program, 
you need to be clearly monitored to be sure that there will be intervention before the cancer progress. So you need to know the complication of the different treatments before you select a treatment. And in fact, many patients, and I see a lot of patients, I don't see them with advanced disease. When they have advanced disease, Fred and uh, Jean-Baptiste and other of my colleagues are seeing these patients. But early on, and I see a lot of patients for opinion for uh, early stage prostate cancer, very often they make their decision not on the cure rate, it's part of the decision, but also they look at the different complications. And very often it's a very significant uh, factor to decide whether you're gonna have uh, active surveillance, radical prostatectomy, or uh, radiotherapy. You also need to know that even if you have complications, there are treatments, and I will focus on treatments of these complications today. So uh, I mentioned radical prostatectomy, uh, erectile dysfunction, and urinary incontinence. This will happen or may happen whatever the technique that is being used, because like Fred mentioned, it's the same intervention, whether you do it with assisted by a robot, by laparoscopy, or by open surgery, you remove the prostate. And when you uh, operate on the prostate, you can harm the, the vessels, the nerves, and sometimes the muscles that are in the area. And after surgery, the complication will happen rapidly. It happens immediately after the surgery, and usually, especially if there is a neurological problem, we call it neuropraxia, if during the surgery the nerve has have been uh, stress or it can take 12 months to recuperate, and some studies have shown that even three to four years after surgery, you can still regain uh, erectile function or you can still regain uh, control on your urine, but the majority of the patient, if they are going to regain erectile function or uh, control of their continence, will, it will happen within a year. Uh, Fred told you where is the prostate, and when you do a surgery, what you do, in fact, you're going to, you remove the prostate and the seminal vesicle. And by doing this, when you remove the prostate, you may injure the, the nerves and the, uh, the vessels that are surrounding the prostate and you can also damage the muscle. So that's why after surgery, you may have these problems. After radiotherapy, you also have these complications. And again, because of radiotherapy, you can have a vascular or a neurological damage. And this will occur not immediately after treatment. This will occur progressively over time. Immediately after radiotherapy, patients sometimes are fatigued, things like that but the effect on erectile function or the problems with their bladder will happen with time. Because when, whether you have a local treatment, curie therapy, or whether you have external beam radiotherapy, you have a, a, a treatment on your prostate, but the radiation will progressively have some effect on the surrounding organs. Our colleagues, radiotherapists, have been very good in the last 20 years to diminish the side effects by having a more precise uh, targeting of the prostate with their different modalities. Can you prevent erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence? Well, with surgery, the best uh, advice uh, we can give is that to try to select a surgeon who has experience. And more and more, and we've seen that in the last 10 years with the new technique, especially with the robot, you need to have a surgeon who has been fellowship trained. So it's not a, a guarantee that there you will have uh, no complication, but if you have a surgeon who have more experience, or you, if you have a young surgeon who have a specialized fellowship on this type of uh, technique, you may have less problem. If you select radiotherapy, well, with radiotherapy, the more focalized the treatment will be, and uh, the, uh, Fred mentioned the cyber knife. The cyber knife is not used very often with the prostate, but with the new conformal radiotherapy treatments, the more focalized the treatment is on the prostate, the less problems you will have. I remember 25, 30 years ago, uh, the, uh, the complication, the size effect of radiotherapy were very high. It has improved a lot in the last 15, 20 years. 
After treatment of cancer, the first month, the patients, they focus on cure. They're very worried about their PSA and they will be worried about the PRC for a long time. But even if they have side effects of their treatment, they really focus on cure and they're ready to have other type of treatment. But with time, more and more, the patient, now that they know that their disease has been treated, it's stable, they, re they're, they get used to having their PSA test done, and even if it goes up a little bit, you know, they will accept the disease, they're used to it, they know that there are other ways of treatment, if there is a recurrence, they will focus more and more on quality of life, and they will look for treatment of erectile uh, function uh, and treatment of their incontinence, and especially a year after surgery or radiotherapy, I see a lot of patients with this problem. And I uh, see a lot of patients with early on uh, prostate cancer for PSA screening or, or patients who have questions about prostate cancer. I don't do any more uh, local treatment for the uh, prostate cancer. They are being referred to my young colleagues who do robotic surgery or open surgery, but I do uh, treat a lot of patients for their complication. If you want to know the treatment of these complications, you need to know how it works. Uh, so if you want to correct erection, you need to know how it works. So an erection is the uh, trapping of blood in the penis. You have relaxation of muscles in the penis and you trap blood in the penis. And if this trapping of blood is a complex phenomenon, it's both vascular, neurologic, uh, and it also occurs in a hormonal climate and in a psychological uh, context. So after a prostatectomy, there is often a neurological problem or a vascular problem, and there is a psychological context. And the patient will wait to hope that their nerves will recuperate and they will get used to their disease, but within some start uh, very early on, after two, three months, they want to have treatments of erectile dysfunction, but the majority of patients wait a little bit more than that. There are many treatments who are available, including sexotherapy, uh, oral medication, intraurethral injection, uh, pumps, vacuum pumps, you can have a pharmacologic erection, and you can put a penile prosthesis to improve the erection. So the psychological uh, complex, what's happening in the brain? You know, a patients uh, don't necessarily need to have a, a radical prostatectomy to have problem with their erections. Very young patients have erectile problem because the brain has a very serious impact on the erection. So having a cancer and the worry that you have with cancer on, on its own is can have a serious impact on your erection. So you should always take into consideration the psychological and the sexual aspect of erectile dysfunction and an evaluation or suggestion of uh, an evaluation by a sexotherapist is something that we strongly recommend. The second line treatment is the pills. Uh, we know that since 1997, Viagra is available, and now we have other products, Cialis, Levitra, Statex, and these medications are medications that are, are helpful to relax the muscles in the penis. And uh, if uh, you use these uh, medications, you will improve your erection. There are controversies whether you should, you, you should use it immediately after surgery to improve your erection. The, the question is not completely there yet. Some are saying, some studies suggest that if you take this medication regularly, immediately after the surgery, you may improve your erections after one year. But other studies have shown that whether you use this medication or not, the number of patients who will have recovered their erection after one year, there is no difference. One thing is sure, is that if you take this medication or if you use injection, you will know sooner if your erections are coming back. And we see a lot of patients who want to regain their erection early on after surgery, and we usually start, uh, we try the medication, and if it doesn't work, we can go to other treatment like uh, the injection in the penis to help obtain erection sooner. Androgens, uh, testosterone, you know, the hormonal climate, 
the majority of men have a normal uh, have normal hormones and sometimes it can be a cause but in the presence of prostate cancer we're very worried of using androgen because as uh, the uh, fred has shown you uh, we try to castrate the patient as much as we can to treat prostate cancer. The idea is that if you have no cancer and you have low testosterone, you should be able to take testosterone because if you have no cancer cells, you will not stimulate your cancer. But uh, the thing is that uh, you're not sure that you don't have cancer until you have been followed by a long period of time. So most of the time, we try to avoid using androgen after prostate cancer treatment. And if we do, we usually, if there is an indication, if the testosterone is low, we usually wait at least six months and even a year. Other options? One of the uh, options is the injection of uh, uh, Muse, that's prostaglandine. There is a special applicator that you put in the distal tip of the penis. It's like a, a little uh, a morceau de, de riz, a rice piece. It's very small. You put this in the distal part of the penis, and by rubbing on this little piece, this will uh, provoke the absorption of prostaglandin, and within 10, 15 minutes, patient can regain an erection. It's not more powerful than the pills you take by mouth, so we usually reserve this treatment when the oral PDE5 inhibitors are not working. We usually recommend first Viagra Cialis. In some patients who have heart conditions, we usually try to avoid uh, Viagra Cialis and Levitra, and we will use uh, the immune system. If oral medication or the MUSE doesn't work, we then go to intracavernous injection. We uh, can show, uh, teach the patient or his partner to inject directly in the corpus cavernosa, in, in the middle of the penis, a product. Uh, I usually tell the patient it's like concentrated Viagra that you inject directly in your penis. And uh, as a joke, I always said that God has, uh, uh, has created man in a good way. The distal part of the penis is very sensitive, but that's not where we put the needle. We put the needle at the base of the penis, and the base of the penis is one part of the body that is the less sensitive. So very often we inject the patient and they don't even realize that we stick the needle in the penis. So the patient learn to inject themselves and they will obtain an erection within 10 to 15 minutes and we usually adjust the dosage so they can have uh, the sexual satisfaction. It works pretty well, very high success rate. However, with time, for different reasons, sometimes it's because of age, uh, there is a high uh, dropout rate with these treatment. Not because it's painful. A patient learn how to do it, but after a year, approximately 50% patient, 50 of the patient drop out of uh, these treatment. Another treatment that we recommend is the vacuum pump with a constriction ring and the way it works. Uh, the patient will put his penis in the, the vacuum and then you will activate the pump and you can have a pump that uh, will uh, sell for a thousand bucks with uh, electric batteries and uh, you know you have fancy pumps but the principle is mechanical or, or electric and it creates a vacuum and the vacuum creates a suction it increases the size of the penis and the patient then puts a, a ring at the base of the penis again there are some studies that have been uh, published saying that if you use this, you will uh, early on after radical treatment, you may improve your erection with time. But again, there are other studies that say that even if you use this, the rate of patient who will regain their erection a year after treatment is not different. However, if you don't use it, you won't have an erection. But if you use this treatment, you will see the erection, you will be able to use it. Some patients are complaining that uh, it's like if you put an elastic band on your finger, after a few minutes your finger becomes cold, the penis will become cold. And the other problem also is that it's kind of tight at the base of the penis to keep the blood in the penis, and there is a, an effet de penture. It's an inch effect at the base of the penis, and some patients <coughs> complain about that. 
but it's uh, again a treatment that works. And if these treatments don't work, the next step, and we go in a stepwise approach, and the patients are the ones who tell us when to stop. Uh, we can do an operation and we can replace the blood in the penis by putting, putting penile prosthesis inside. And there are two types of penile prosthesis. Some are what we call semi-rigid. They are always uh, elongated, but you can bend them. So uh, if you put your pants, you can hide your penis on the side. Or there are some models with uh, inflatable penile prosthesis. They're more expensive, a little bit more complicated to install. But we do uh, put penile prosthesis in patients. Uh, if, uh, if and, and again, it depends on the lifestyle of the patient. I, do, uh, I have more requests for this treatment in younger patients, but I have patients who are in their 70s and sometimes in their 80s, and they want to have these treatments. So the, these patients, the choice of the treatment for erectile dysfunction, we always start from the more simple to the more complicated. Uh, proceeding with treatment will vary with age and will also vary with the general health being of the patient. Uh, many patients will stop after oral treatments. They will try oral treatment. If it works, it works. If it stops working, they stop there. After erectile, after uh, the uh, pro pharmacologic erection program or the vacuum pump, approximately 50% of the patient will drop out of this treatment after a year. And at maximum, one or two percent of the patient uh, will end up uh, having a penile prosthesis. But it's a treatment that is available. Now we look at the treatments of urinary incontinence. So what is the role of the bladder? The bladder is a reservoir that allows normally to accommodate a large quantity of liquid before you feel that you need to go. And the uh, outlet of the bladder is under the control of a sphincter. It's a voluntary sphincter that we can control. And when you go to the toilet and you're normal, the first thing you do is when you go to the toilet, you relax your sphincter to empty your bladder. But if you lose the control of the sphincter, you may lose your urine when it's not time to uh, empty your bladder. So after a radical prostatectomy, that's a complication. It occurs very frequently the first months after the surgery. But after a year, about, you know, we, we rarely see guys wearing a pad normally. But after a radical prostatectomy, you will have 10, 15 percent of patients who will wear a pad, they know, they know themselves. If they do a lot of exercise, they may wear a little pad sometimes. And for many patients, it's okay. But few patients, three to 5% of the patient, they really leak a lot and they want to uh, have a definitive treatment for that. So the, uh, why it happens? Well, the prostate is, uh, as we mentioned, right between the bladder and the sphincter. So when you, we do surgery around there, we end up uh, potentially damaging the sphincter. We end up having the bladder that will act against the sphincters. If the sphincters are good, no problem. If the sphincter is weakened, we will act to increase the pressure here. We have to remember that sometimes the problem is not the sphincter. Sometimes the bladder also can give problems. And uh, many uh, patients uh, have urinary, like I mentioned with radiotherapy, many patients have urinary problems. It's not because they have weakened sphincters, it's because due to the effect of the radiotherapy, there may be some uh, hyperactivity of the bladder. So the treatments for that, well, we can use oral treatments when the bladder is the problem. There are many different treatments. You may have heard some of these, Ditropen, D12, Vizicare, Toviaz, uh, Trozec and Ablex, Mirbitrec, they are all treatments, medical treatments to help diminish the activity of the bladder. If we then focus uh, below the bladder, you can do Kegel exercises. The Kegel exercises are the exercises that are recommended after uh, pregnancy, after a woman will give birth. If she has weakened sphincters, we teach them to do Kegel exercises. These exercises can be done by the patients. They can, uh, you can hire a, a trainer to improve the quality of your exercise, and this is called perineal reeducation. Again, initially, some studies were saying that with perineal reeducation, you will 
improve uh, the control of urine one year after surgery. Many studies have been done, and in fact, whether you do perineal reeducation or not, after a year, you won't have more control on your bladder. However, the patients who do perineal reeducation, the ones who are going to recuperate, will re recuperate quicker if they do these education and this reeducation, but the, the three to five percent of patients at one year will be the same. Then for these patients, we will offer them different treatments like the slings, uh, some balloons that we can, can put around the urethra, there is the artificial sphincter, and then there are palliative treatments that we can use. So when we speak about uh, subureteral slings, in fact, what we do is after the surgery, we go and we put right under the prostate, well, now the prostate, I just realized that this is not a, a good drawing because the prostate should be gone, but we don't just do it for patients who had a radical prostatectomy, but on the talk on radical prostatectomy, I should remove, I should remove the prostate here, but it's the same type of treatment. What we do is we go and we put a passive pressure under the urethra, and we have been using these slings for about 15, 20 years, and I've been a little bit reluctant using these slings because I've been putting sphincters for artificial sphincter for 30 years. And the artificial sphincters, I put it on, I can tell the patient it's gonna be what it's gonna be tomorrow. I can predict the postoperative period how it's gonna work, uh, how many patients will be. I cannot tell you in advance which one will fail, but I know for the majority of patients how, how, how it will work. With the slings, we had improvements of incontinence, but the rates were more around 30, 50% of cure and uh, 30, 40% uh, of improvement. And this, is, this was not enough for me. So I, I did put many slings, but it was more on the request of the patient than my, my will, because I preferred to put the artificial sphincter to give a better continence to the patient. There are also some balloons that you can put uh, to create uh, like an, uh, an obstruction just below the bladder. This is to create a small prostate, in fact, two lobes the, to, to recreate the prostate to do some compression. The problem with this is that to try with these needles to go put the balloons exactly in face one to each other is very difficult, and again, the success rate to cure incontinence with this technique is between 30 and 50% of the patient. In the last three years, there is a new sling that came out, and the new sling is uh, the same thing as the other one, it's a sling, but there is a balloon that is fixed on the sling with a little tube that you put and that you can palpate under the skin beside a testicle, and what we do, we put the sling, we increase the balloon, and if the patient comes after the operation and he still leaks, we can re-inject some liquid and we can improve the efficacy of the sling. And with this treatment now, I strongly believe that we have seen for the first time in the last two, three years, an improvement in the sling, and now with this technique, we can improve a continence in, and propose a treatment that will cure them in over 80% of the patient. Uh, the artificial urinary sphincter, in fact, it's a, it's a mechanical system that we put around the urethra. It's like, I call it a tie wrap that we, we, we put around the urethra. It's connected with a valve and with a balloon that generates a pressure in, in the belly. And what it does, it occludes the lumen of the urethra and when the patient wants to uh, uh, urinate, he just palpate the pump and he will open the, uh, the, 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 the tie wrap. He will open the, uh, the, the cuff and he will be able to urinate. But you need to have a patient who is motivated, who understands how it works. He needs to have good dexterity and he needs to have uh, his cognition. One of the problems I've seen with this type of treatment it's fantastic for 15, 20 years, but if a patient becomes dement or has dementia because he gets older, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. And initially, I was putting these sphincters from 50 years of age to 80 years of age, but with time, 
I've stopped putting these sphincters in patients who are over 75 years old most of the time because the chances of them being becoming confused, the chances with age increases, and if they're not able to manipulate the sphincter, they're unable to pee. So I prefer now to put a choker. The choker is the sling that we put around. I, I tell the patient, one is a choker and the other one is a tie wrap. That's how it works. Patient understand that very well. It works pretty well. The patient, we don't promise that they're gonna be dry. We tell them that they will uh, use less a pad or less a day, and I tell this to my patient, and that's what happens. Uh, sometimes with time, because there is pressure around the urethra, sometimes the, uh, the efficacy of the sphincter will go down, and I usually tell the patient, if you leak more after two, three, five, 10, 15 years, come back to see me. What we do, we increase the amount of fluid or we change the cuff and the patient will be in control again. Finally, if these treatments are not indicated or if uh, the patient is not uh, a candidate, there are other ways to control the urine. And there are some uh, the pains, uh, some um, clamps that can be used, the dribble stop clamp or the Cunningham clamp, are clamps that will help during the day the patient to control their leakage. Some patient will uh, wear some, c'est des étui in English, it's, uh, come on, huh? Yeah, it's, it's condom with, uh, don't use them to prevent uh, pregnancy because they have a hole at the tip to put a tube. But in fact, they're exactly like condom that they are, they are on the penis, but there's a hole at the tip and it will empty in a bag. Uh, the diapers also, in the last 30 years, I've seen a change in the diapers. The quality of the diapers have changed. Now, you know, they, they, they can hold a lot of fluid, much more than the, the, it, was, it was before. It's expensive, it's a problem. Uh, there are some uh, reusable uh, slip for uh, men that can be used. And finally, if nothing works, we can put a Foley catheter. It's really a last resort. So as a conclusion, the treatment of prostate, uh, the treatments of prostate cancer can have consequences on the genitourinary system. Patient needs to be informed about these potential complications before they select a treatment. And uh, they uh, need to know that there are strategies to prevent these complications. And they also need to know that there are treatments to correct these problems if they occur. That's the end.